Hi, this is John Scott of the Pew Charitable Trust. Thank you. Uh, we'll get the webinar started in just a minute or two to allow some more folks to log on. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar discussion about the cost of insufficient retirement savings in Pennsylvania. My name is John Scott, and I direct the Retirement Savings Project at the Pew Charitable Trust. For the past few years, Pew has been looking at the barriers to private sector retirement savings, as well as assessing different policy approaches to addressing those barriers. You can find our research on these topics at pewtrust.org slash retirement savings. The URL is shown on your screen here. A critical question concerns the effects of insufficient retirement savings. And today we'll be discussing that question from the perspective of the effects on government and the economy. I'm joined today by Pennsylvania State Treasurer Joseph Torsella and eConsult Solutions economist Ethan Connor Ross. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, everyone except the speakers are in listen only mode, but feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar by clicking on the control panel on the right side of your screen. Once you do, please enter your question into the questions box. And don't forget to include your name so we know where the question is coming from. We'll address your questions at the end of the presentations. So Treasurer Torsella, let me ask you to get us started. You campaigned on the issue of retirement security for private sector workers, and you followed through by convening a bipartisan task force which recently wrapped up a series of public hearings over the past few months. Why have you made retirement security a priority for Pennsylvania? Thanks, John, and hello, everyone. This is Joe Torsella, Pennsylvania State Treasurer. Um, thanks for your interest, uh, for joining us, and thank you, John and Pew team, for your work uh, in this topic, uh, your ongoing work on this topic. Um, we have made this a priority for a couple reasons, and. Interestingly, when you're a state official and you talk about retirement, most people assume that the subject is public sector pensions, uh, which are important, which have been the subject of many webinars, uh, many of them hosted by Pew. Um, but uh, what's clear from the work we've done and from what we're seeing as, as national data as well is that we have a kind of a, a different kind of crisis that is on a slower fuse getting much less attention, um, but with vast and uh, vast and troubling implications, and, and I'll come back to this, 
but actually with some real hopeful possibilities about how to attack it. Um, but the data that we see is, you know, cause for alarm. There's in in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, there's some two million people who working Pennsylvanians, but who are working in workplaces without an easy way to save for retirement. Um, and put that fact together with some things we know more generally that 50 percent uh, of people don't have a single dollar saved for retirement outside of outside of Social Security, and that of those who do save, the median savings is something like $1,300, um, maybe $3,000. Um, those those things spell trouble for us on two counts. And Pennsylvania Pennsylvania Treasury, like a lot of treasuries, sort of recognizes the fundamental fact that. There's no fiscally healthy commonwealth unless there are fiscally healthy families within the commonwealth. Um, so part of this is historically we have had a, an interest in kind of generally financial security of Pennsylvanians growing out of, like many treasuries, our work with 529s and college savings, where, by the way, now we see a kind of crossover effect from people's lack of retirement preparedness and, and the implications uh, the way these two things interact. Um, part of it also is sort of a harder-nosed concern because you know, our day-to-day -day concern are the, is the finances uh, of the general fund um, in Pennsylvania. And we had last year in Pennsylvania, for those of you joining us from other states, we had a four-month budget impasse um, where there was a, 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 a prolonged argument over roughly the size of the amount uh, of the state budget that we can attribute to insufficient retirement savings. So there's a real um, kind of you know, hard-nosed dollars and cents concern for those of us who are state policymakers about what the precise implications of this are. Now, we wanted to get some clarity on what the fiscal impact actually will be to Pennsylvania. We wanted to go beyond what we saw, um, some good work in, in uh, a handful of other states, but to ask the question, okay, what what is the Apart from the impact on families, which I do not want to minimize, um, what is the impact on the Commonwealth's books and on the taxpayers um, of insufficient savings? And if we could you know, imagine uh, something that would adjust that savings delta, you know, what, what might the, you know, the converse is what might the benefit to the state look like um, and relief to taxpayers? Uh, so we, we did, as you said, we put together a, a retirement task force that has um, broadened by partisan representation from all four finance chairs of the Pennsylvania House and Senate, both parties, um, from business, from labor, from interested stakeholders. Uh, it's been a couple of months and uh, four hearings sort of getting some clarity around the nature of the problem. Um, and then under the, the study was featured in one of the hearings, um, understanding the fiscal impact of Pennsylvania, which I think to some degree what we're going to talk about has broad implications for all other states. Uh, Pennsylvania's demographics are especially pronounced. We are currently the seventh oldest state. Um, the, the retirement age population is expected to increase substantially over the course of the 15-year period of the study. So we have we have a particularly strong interest uh, in it in Pennsylvania. Um, but the study, I, I think, did exactly what we we're hoping for. Gave some, to the extent you can, some real precision to these numbers, some sense of the scope, and I think. It, not to be, not to be quantitative. The scope of this is dramatic, um, it, it, as we suspected. Um, there are significant impacts uh, to, to the state's finances going forward um, from the state of our retirement unpreparedness. I want to want to end my sort of opening comments here on a hopeful note. Um, part of our interest in this grows out of the fact that there has been good and bipartisan interest in in finding ways the state. Uh, might facilitate solutions um, going on in the Pennsylvania legislature now for, for some time. There's a, there have been uh, bipartisan talk in both the Senate and the House and, and good interest from both parties. Uh, so although these numbers are sobering, I, I want to underscore that I think, and maybe this is especially powerful in the, in the divided age in which we live, I think there is real potential, as we're seeing in other states, there's real potential for meaningful state action in a way that um, can find bipartisan support and has found bipartisan support. I'm, I'm hopeful that is, in fact, uh, the case in Pennsylvania. So I know we're going to talk a lot today about the problem and the, and the numbers around the problem. I want to underscore, though, uh, we're doing this 
with a purpose, and that is we believe there is uh, yeah, there are potential solutions, and that they're most importantly achievable. Well, that's terrific, and, and I absolutely agree. I, I think these numbers are sobering, and, and I would just add um, this is an excellent study that was done, and this is one of the reasons why we wanted to have this webinar today was to really sort of bring out some of these numbers in a little more detail because of the, the quality of the study. Not to butter up our next speaker at all, but but. Uh, but, but I think it's important to know that to get to solutions, we have to have good numbers. And I think we have some very good numbers here. Um, why don't, with that, why don't I turn it over to Ethan Connor Ross of eConsult? And uh, so, Ethan. Thank you, John, and, uh, and thank you to the treasurer for, for that introduction. Um, with eConsult Solutions, we're a Philadelphia based firm uh, that specializes in, in economics and, and public policy. And um, just to situate this issue a, a little bit, uh, there's really been an increasing focus on retirement security as a public policy issue for, for all the reasons that the treasurer just described. Um, there's certainly consequences for, for private citizens and for their financial well-being, but there's also an increasing focus on how that translates um, to public consequences um, in terms of uh, state budgets and in terms of, of state economic activity. So there's, there's been studies uh, at the state and federal level, um, a couple of recent studies uh, out of the states of Utah and Maine that looked at public assistance costs for future retirees. Uh, and the work that we've done for the PA Treasury um, really builds on and extends this research framework uh, to look comprehensively uh, at the impacts of, of insufficient retirement savings in Pennsylvania. So I'll take you through the, the methodology that we used uh, and the results that we arrived at in Pennsylvania. Um, in, in terms of the, the methodology, there's really two sides to this equation um, that we looked at. Um, there's, there's one side is, is state assistance costs. So um, the state uh, of Pennsylvania and, and certainly other states uh, have spending on elderly assistance programs. Um, many of these programs are means tested. So to the extent uh, that folks don't have uh, sufficient retirement savings, they will qualify um, for uh, either more or, or greater benefits. Um, but there's also an implication for economic activity. So if uh, households have fewer dollars to spend, uh, they spend less in the economy and, and this has an impact uh, on the state's employment and the tax base. So uh, expenditures go up, revenues go down, uh, effects really on, on both sides of the equation. In terms of our methodology, one of the things that was unique here is, is we try to take a net approach. Um, so rather than just aggregating up all of the anticipated costs, uh, we really wanted to ask the question of, of what portion of that was due to, to insufficient savings. So um, what are the anticipated costs, but also what might those costs be um, if, if folks were saving at a higher level? And, and the difference there uh, is really the, the net cost that we've calculated. Uh, so that really begs the question, um, what would sufficient savings look like? Um, and here we've, we've borrowed a framework from financial advisors on um, sort of how they look at it. If someone heads into a financial advisor to ask, how much should I be saving? Um, these are sort of the two ways that it's looked at. And, and one is a lump sum target, um, while the other is, is an income replacement target. The, the goal of either is, is really to maintain a living standard in retirement. And, and that's why you see both of these tied to um, what working age incomes uh, ultimately are. Um, but in a lump sum framework, um, you're really targeting a certain account balance in, in private savings. So a sample target might be um, eight to 10 times your annual working income um, should effectively be, be sitting in an account accessible to you um, during your retirement years. Um, and by contrast, the, the annual replacement framework uh, looks at, at the, the portion of income that's available per year. Um, so this is more comprehensive. It includes uh, the drawdown from your lump sum savings, um, but also includes other categories, um, ongoing income like social security, other assets, earned income, importantly, um, some folks continue to work uh, through their elderly years, uh, and a sample target there would be 70 to 85 percent uh, of your working age income. And I do want to note that these frameworks aren't necessarily contradictory. Uh, there's sort of two ways of, of looking at uh, how savings may be accumulated, um, but we use the annual replacement framework in our study, um, largely because we consider it more comprehensive. It's, it's accounting for all types of income uh, and not just private savings. That's, that's one component of it. Um, but the other thing that's, that's useful in, in our context is it's closely tied to program eligibility um, for a lot of the state assistance programs. And what a household spends on an annual basis is, is again, tied to how much income is available each year. Uh, so we use a 75% standard, um, which is uh, sort of on the, on the low end uh, of that recommended range. Um, so the idea is that a sufficient savings, as defined by our report um, in our analysis, would be 75% of working age income. So there's a quick example graphic here of, of how that works in the actual calculation. 
if you have a, a household that has a working age income uh, of 60,000 before they retire, uh, sufficient savings would be set at, at 45,000 at 75 percent of that. If in fact their retirement income were 30,000, that gap there, uh, the insufficient savings level would be measured at 15,000. So we use this approach to model across the whole distribution uh, of households. We look at the working age population, the, the 50 to 64 year olds as of the year 2000 um, as the, the working age baseline, and then what income that group had available to them in retirement in the year 2015. Uh, and we find an average gap of, of $4,200 per household. So this is an average. Uh, certainly there's some households uh, that have saved sufficiently. Certainly there are some that have a bigger number than that, such that it, it, it averages out to that number, uh, which is certainly substantial across the full state population. Uh, that 4,200 uh, number that I referenced does have a couple of adjustments in it where uh, the replacement framework that we use overall is somewhat problematic from a public policy perspective. Um, one is below the federal poverty line. So uh, there may be a household, you can see in the example on the left, that had a working age income of, of 10,000 and then a retirement annual income of 8,000. A strict application of a 75% standard uh, would say that that is a sufficient amount of savings for that household. Um, but we did not consider uh, savings below the, the federal poverty level, which is uh, 11,700 for uh, a single household and, and larger for uh, larger size households to be sufficient um, in terms of, of being adequately resourced and, and prepared for retirement. So um, in those cases, we do treat the difference between the income available uh, and the federal poverty level as a gap that we measure in that number. Conversely, though, uh, there may be households uh, at the higher end of the income scale that have not uh, met the savings replacement standard, but may still have sufficient income. Um, for example, a, a $400,000 household um, would be recommended to have $300,000 in annual income available to them to maintain their standard of living. Uh, if they have $200,000 instead, uh, there certainly is a gap there from a financial planning perspective, um, but not one uh, that's necessarily concerning from a public policy perspective. So uh, for households above $75,000, we considered those incomes to be sufficient without any adjustment for the gap. So we use this comparison between baseline and sufficient incomes, this uh, $4,200 per, per household, to assess the impact on state assistance costs and, and on the state economy. So we'll start with state assistance costs. Well, the question here is really, what does the state spend today on uh, elderly residents, which we define as, as 65 plus, and then again, how much of that cost is due to reduced incomes from insufficient savings? So we start by going through the state budget in detail um, and identifying programs that are targeted to elderly residents. So I do want to note here we exclude generalized programs uh, that elderly residents uh, take advantage of along with everyone else, something like public safety, uh, roads, et cetera. Um, certainly all residents benefit from those type of programs, but uh, there's no meaningful connection between the savings levels of elderly residents and, and state expenditures. So we're really looking at um, these assistance programs that you see listed on the screen. Um, Medicaid is, is the largest chunk um, for the state of Pennsylvania. These are uh, 2016 budget numbers that, you, that you're looking at here. And uh, I do want to note, um, folks often associate Medicare as the, the primary insurance program for elderly residents, and, and that certainly is the case. Um, but there are a number of residents, um, particularly on, on income-based or disability-based, that are dual eligible for both programs, um, both Medicare and Medicaid, and significant Medicaid expenditures uh, for the elderly population. Um, and long-term care representing the biggest chunk of that um, when folks uh, are often at, at end of life or, or have any other uh, medical, medical needs. Um, so we went through each of the programs that you see on the screen um, and identified the portion that were spent on elderly residents uh, and then further the, the portion that's state funded. So we don't include um, any federal funding here, um, which would certainly add additional dollars on top. We don't include local funding. Um, we do include all sources of Pennsylvania funds. Uh, you see there uh, about half of these uh, program expenditures come from the general fund, uh, the other half from, from other funds, and, and notable among them is the lottery fund in Pennsylvania. The, uh, the lottery in Pennsylvania benefits older Pennsylvanians and contributes a significant amount of funding to these programs. So our approach is really to start with the total number uh, that's spent uh, in these, on these programs and, and share down from there, uh, such that our analysis is ultimately tied to the state budget. It's, it's not purely an estimate of who is eligible for what program, um, but starts with actual observed spending uh, on elderly residents of, of $4.25 billion in FY 2016. So we 
we allocate that spending, that $4.25 billion, um, by income band. And, and this is where we can really begin to differentiate uh, what the net effect is of, of the insufficient savings. So here we use a, a mix of eligibility standards and program data. Uh, in some cases, the actual expenditures are reported for each program uh, by income level, um, but often we have to rely on, on who is eligible to the program uh, and extrapolate from there to, to see what the expenditures are. We're showing these results on a per capita basis, and the average you see is about 2,000 per resident. Uh, as you expect, there's a, a steep decline as, as income increases, and uh, the 21% of, of the population with the lowest incomes, uh, beneath 20,000 per year in retirement, accounts for 54% of the expenditures. But it is notable, there are still significant expenditures for uh, sort of the, the middle class households that you see here. Uh, around the median of, of 40,000, you still see uh, per capita state expenditures of about 1,500. Uh, and 50% of the population accounts for 83% of the expenditures. So we run these expenditures under two scenarios. The, the baseline is the, our projection of what the state actually spent uh, in FY 2016. Uh, and then the sufficient savings scenario is what the state would have spent uh, had incomes uh, been at the higher level achieved by, uh, by folks meeting that sufficient 75% standard that we described. So this net difference here uh, is 700 million for the year 2015. And, and this is the number that the treasurer referenced um, was approximately the amount of, of the state's budget shortfall that was, that was hotly debated for several months over the past summer. Importantly, uh, that's a baseline number, um, but we, we wanna project it forward to 2030 because there's significant reason to think uh, that this number is, is, is expected to grow. Um, so we've used some simplifying assumptions in projecting forward, um, but we do wanna make sure that we account for, for structural factors. And the biggest one here is population growth. Um, I think folks are, are all aware of sort of the, the demographic shape of the baby boom generation. Uh, and you can see at the top uh, in blue that, that the baby boom generation is largely situated from 50 to 64 as of 2015, um, but these folks will sort of be crossing over the, the threshold uh, into the 65 plus population over the next 15 years. Uh, and the state's independent fiscal office in Pennsylvania uh, projects a 42% growth in elderly population over that time, um, adding almost a million people, growing from 2.2 million to 3.1 million. So we know the income of these folks as of 2015. Um, the folks that are in blue were able to observe through government data what money they have today. Um, so what we've done is, is assume uh, that the savings trends that we observe from 2000 to 2015 um, will essentially replicate themselves um, from 2015 to 2030 uh, in order to construct a, a baseline scenario. Um, and then we have again modeled a sufficient savings scenario uh, in which the folks are able to replace 75% of their income. So again, we have a gap um, between anticipated retirement incomes in 2030 and current incomes uh, of about 4,800, increasing slightly from the 4,200 that we have today. Uh, another thing that we want to account for moving forward is, is rising medical costs. So we have seen uh, over the past 30 years and, and going back even further, a significant delta between overall inflation and inflation and medical costs that's anticipated to continue into the future. Uh, these are CBO projections um, from the Congressional Budget Office that were offered um, as some of the National uh, Affordable Care Act debates went on last year. Uh, a 3%, 3.7% 3 increase in medical costs through 2030 but only a 2.4% increase in inflation, um, which means that medical costs are anticipated to be 21% uh, more expensive relative to other costs uh, in 15 years. So this is important because even assuming a, a, just a continuity of programs, eligibility standards, benefit levels, it's essentially gonna be 20% more expensive for the state to provide the same level of care um, to the same folks 15 years from now. And given the centrality of medical costs to the overall state spending, um, this has a huge budgetary impact. So we use these factors to estimate a, a 2030 endpoint um, for both the baseline scenario and for the sufficient savings scenario, uh, along with the 2015 starting point that we just showed and, and assume a consistent growth rate in the years in between. Uh, and you can see uh, the blue bars are the sufficient savings scenario growing. Um, and then uh, the gray on top of that is really the net difference. Um, between our anticipated costs and the costs under that scenario. So the net grows uh, from about 700 million today to 1.1 billion in 2030. And importantly, uh, these are in constant dollars. So we're not seeing the effects of inflation here. 
we're really seeing the effects of growth in two ways. We're seeing the effects of, of population growth in terms of uh, who's in that elderly cohort, and then we're seeing the effects of, of the medical spending growth that we just described. Uh, and cumulative over those years, um, these annual totals add up to, to $14.3 billion over the period. So next we move on to sort of the other side of the equation, um, as I described, which is the impact from reduced household spending. So in addition to greater assistance costs from the state, uh, lower incomes in retirement mean less consumption for households. Uh, and these effects are, are felt across the state economy and ultimately to the state tax base. So we've developed uh, an expenditure profile for, for elderly households in each income band based on current spending information. The average elderly household spends about 35000 a year, uh, and as income increases, overall expenditures increase as, as you would expect. But these increases are not fully linear, um, meaning that an extra dollar that a household earns doesn't necessarily translate into a dollar of spending. Um, because wealthier households spend uh, more in total, but less as a proportion of their income, and are able to devote more to savings. Uh, the other thing that's not fully linear is the composition of goods change. So you see a couple examples here at the bottom of the screen. Um, something like food is, is relatively fixed. As income increases, uh, households can spend a little more on food uh, at the upper income levels, but not necessarily a lot more. Um, by contrast, some goods are highly discretionary and, and very highly with income, such as travel. Um, a, a household might, might spend very little on travel or, or might spend a lot uh, at, at the higher income level. So uh, we've taken uh, account of this by developing a unique spending profile um, by income band for, for elderly households. Uh, and I do want to note here, we're dealing only with, with elderly households. We don't account for any spending effects that increased savings might have uh, among non-elderly households. Uh, so again, we take a net approach here. Um, we look at what the, we believe the household spending to be among elderly households as of 2015. That's the baseline scenario. And uh, we believe Pennsylvania's elderly households spent approximately 50 billion in 2015. Uh, but based on our modeling of uh, what incomes would have been under sufficient savings scenario, uh, that expenditure would have been about $52 billion for a net difference uh, of $2 billion. And again, that gap varies um, by the type of good based on the unique spending profiles that we developed. Uh, so this is something we've projected over time as well. Um, you see the growth, uh, again, driven primarily by population growth in the, in the elderly population. Um, rising from about $2 billion to about $3 billion um, as the, uh, the spend under sufficient savings grows a little bit faster than the baseline spend over time. Uh, and the cumulative loss here is, is estimated at $40 billion over the 15-year period. So this net, net loss in household spending is, is modeled in terms of its impact on the state economy. Um, so one thing we need to do in order to do that is deduct spending that's taking place outside of the state. So uh, leakage can, can take place outside of the state economy in two ways. Um, one can be physical. Uh, obviously, a household can spend money in a different state, whether on vacation or, or just making a purchase across the border, um, but can also be transactional. If goods are purchased online, uh, it doesn't necessarily have an effect in the state economy. Um, but we do size the gap at about $1.6 billion in lost spending as of today in the state. Uh, and then we use input-output modeling to quantify the full economic effect of that loss in spending on the state. So two, two types of spillover impacts are modeled based on this direct spending. Uh, there is indirect effects, which is from uh, suppliers that, that ramp up their activity in response to the initial spending. Uh, and then there's induced effects uh, from earnings from that initial spending that are respent in the local economy. Um, so on, you know, on groceries, on housing, on, on all of the things that Pennsylvania employees across a range of sectors would ultimately spend on. So the $1.6 billion in, in direct loss leads to $2.8 billion in total loss. Uh, that's a multiplier of, of 1.7, which is sort of a, a typical range that you typically see. Uh, and it also leads to $850 million in lost earnings and 20,000 lost jobs um, from this loss of, of direct spending by elderly households. Um, we take this out over time as well. Uh, these numbers grow uh, from $2.8 billion to, to $4.3 billion by 2030, um, more than 31,000 jobs in 2030 and $1.3 billion in earnings and a cumulative loss in, in economic activity of $56 billion over the full period. This lost economic activity also has an impact on the state's tax base um, in, in two ways. There is a loss uh, of direct sales tax uh, on the initial spend by these households, um, and then there is a loss um, on all kinds of, of tax uh, bases, income tax, sales tax, business tax, uh, from the overall economic activity that it supports. 
Um, so we've estimated 70 million in, in lost state tax revenue in 2015 from the, the 2.8 billion in output. Uh, and then again, that growth trend over time, growing to over 100 million by 2030 um, and totaling 1.4 billion over the period. Um, so to, to kind of wrap up here, um, we have a quick summary slide here of, of these big numbers across the categories. Um, and the, the magnitude is really significant. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, the state assistance costs uh, growing from 700 million to over a billion and, and totaling over 14 billion, um, large losses in, in household spending and in the economic activity attributable to that spending, uh, and then a loss in tax revenue. So um, it's big numbers, sobering numbers, and, and importantly, as I referenced earlier, uh, losses on both sides of the equation, uh, increased costs to the state and decreased revenue to the state as well. Um, so to summarize and, and kind of situate this within the broader issue, um, I, you know, I think we've, we've demonstrated here the magnitude of the issue on a number of fronts. Um, certainly the, the well-being of, of individual citizens uh, and their ability to, to save for retirement is important, um, but we also see impacts on the state budget, also see impacts on the state economy. Uh, our study is, is really about sizing the problem. Um, it does not assume that any particular policy intervention is put in place. It doesn't size the results of those. Um, but uh, the, the, the treasurer um, and, and the task force as laid out uh, is certainly interested in, in looking at actual options, uh, which takes you to a, a different level of analysis. Um, the, the things that would be considered in a, in a feasibility study or a program evaluation uh, is at some level a different set of issues. Uh, what are the financial parameters of a program? How many participants might you expect? How many dollars? What are the, the asset returns? Um, what are the accumulations for private sector workers who participate in the program on an individual level, um, but it does connect back to these numbers um, because ultimately there are fiscal and economic consequences to the state. Um, and of course, once a, a program is already in place, um, there's assessments that could be done as well uh, in terms of, of how the policy is working. Um, so I'll leave it there, um, and I think we'll, we'll have a chance to open it up for questions. Thanks, Ethan. Um, folks out, out there listening, if you haven't done so already, can submit a question by using the control panel on the right side of your screen in the questions box. Um, let me just uh, allow Ethan to sort of uh, catch his breath and get a drink of water. Um, let me turn it back to the treasurer. And you know, you, you had this presented to the task force uh, a month or two ago. We had a chance to reflect on this when we heard it again. Um, maybe just sort of uh, reflect on some of the, the key numbers or themes that you're hearing in the study. What's, what's important to you or stands out to you? Sure. Well, I think the, the reaction in general was this, the study was the study was eye opening. Uh, everyone understood uh, that you know because we've seen sort of different pieces of the elephant. You know, understood that we in fact have a crisis with wide implications. I don't think anyone quite understood how dramatic the fiscal implications are. Um, and again, this is putting you know. We are necessarily here focusing on the impact to the to the Commonwealth budget because that's the subject of the study. Um, there, there's also a series of family impacts that get played out uh, that are worthy of their own yeah. webinar um, in all kinds of ways. I mean, we, we, and and those stories are becoming are becoming more common as the demographics drive this impending wave of retirement. Uh, that doesn't look for most people like anything uh, uh, like anything that they ex or for many people like anything they expected or hoped for. Um, so I don't want to give those short shrift, but just in terms again of the of the sort of Commonwealth books, um, and even if we put aside the economic impact number, I don't think we should because I do think that was one of the um, that's one of the in innovations in the study. But just looking at the public assistance alone. Um, you know, a north of $14 billion number is substantial. The context that both Ethan and I gave a little bit of is the, the, the in, in Pennsylvania's approximately $30 billion budget, um, the four-month, you know, four-month impasse uh, beyond the constitutional deadline was largely devoted to the question of how do we solve a, an approximately $700 million gap in the budget? There was a there was a, pre, a gap from the previous year that everyone agreed, unwisely or not, to borrow to solve. So that, so you know, the, 
the, those uh, 120 days of impasse were around a $700 million question. I thought it was striking and fascinating that uh, you know, that, that if we nudged, and we can come back to that idea because I think that's really important, the behavioral economics of this, if we nudge uh, savings in a direction uh, that we that we close the insufficiency gap, we in the, in 2015 that's a that's a 700 million dollar impact. I thought that was a fascinating coincidence. Um, so so in general, I think the reaction to this, and, and I do think this is a sort of these things are all estimates and. Let's not be overly confident about what they suggest, but if we're off by a little, we at least have a sort of sense of the magnitude of this, and, and everyone's sense of it was, you know, it's a bit of a jaw dropper. Um, I'm going to choose again to see it in the other direction, which is, given the other thing we learned from the task force, that how solvable some of this problem may be with some kind of common ground solutions, um, I think unlike a lot of these kinds of things where there's a, a big price tag to a problem that no one has any good idea about how to solve, uh, there's a more hopeful landscape here. And I guess maybe, uh, yeah, let, me, let me just turn to you really quickly. Um, obviously, the study is focused on Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania has a lot of characteristics that, that make it unique. Um, the treasurer mentioned uh, Pennsylvania is the seventh oldest state, for example. Um, Oh, you know, can you say whether or not this analysis is applicable to other states? You know, and, and if so, what are some of the common themes just based upon your overall work? Yeah, I think the, the basic structure actually could be undertaken somewhere else as well. Uh, certainly Pennsylvania is, is one of the older states, but the general shape of, uh, of the population um, that, that we showed here, the, the baby boomer cohort, it is larger than the cohort that preceded it and the cohort that followed it in many states, uh, you know, nationally. So that's consistent across states. Uh, and this healthcare issue, I, I think, is a really important structural one, too. And, and certainly it's consistent, um, not a Pennsylvania-specific issue. So to the extent uh, that there's more retirees and healthcare costs are going up, um, that's really a sort of a one-two that applies everywhere. Um, obviously, any state budget is going to be unique, and, and, and an analysis would have to dive into what are some of the specific drivers what are the, the state-specific programs? How is Medicaid handled? How is it supplemented um, with other spending? But, um, but many of these structural forces uh, are there anywhere. Um, and, you know, even beyond the, the baby boomer generation, um, that's sort of the scope of this study, and it is hard to make projections, you know, beyond the 15-year window. Um, the, the, the variance uh, between projections and results starts to, um, you know, get, get wider the further out you go. Um, but from a policy intervention standpoint, certainly a, a program that's put in place today um, may have uh, the, the broadest effects on those that could start saving early. Uh, so, you know, generations uh, going beyond are, are the ones uh, that ultimately may benefit and may see the biggest impact from some of the programs that have, have been suggested. Uh, great. So um, we're starting to get a couple of questions. Uh, let me just ask one more question of the, the treasurer. Um, you've wrapped up the task force hearings. Um, so, you know, just based upon not just the, the testimony from Ethan that you heard, but sort of the whole length of all the hearings, you know, what kinds of solutions um, should Pennsylvania be looking at if, if you want to venture out that far? And uh, ideally, how would you like the Commonwealth to address the issue of insufficient retirement savings? I mean, you mentioned nudging, uh, but let me just talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, and the first, the first two hearings uh, were kind of more granular in the experience of both employees and employers, and I think what we learned from that, as well as well as some some uh, sessions with some behavioral economists, I think what we learned from that is there's a real yearning for kind of real world practical solutions uh, here. Um, the takeaway we had, and then our, the, the final hearing was where we sort of tried to survey the landscape of solutions, which broadly fell into a couple of categories. Um, uh, at, at one end of the spectrum, uh, there's the notion of kind of a marketplace, which is to make more information about appropriate options available to employers. Um, uh, at the other end is sort of the states that are pursuing a kind of an auto uh, IRA model, um, which is essentially establishing a kind of a, 
a portable IRA funded with employees' own money, no employer contribution uh, for all businesses you know, within, with some constraints of a certain size who do not have a 401k plan. Um, and then there's a multiple employer plan model uh, that Vermont, and to some extent, uh, on a pilot basis in Massachusetts, are pursuing, um, which is saying, okay, we'll, we'll take, we the state will take the ERISA uh, and administrative burdens off you, employer, and, and kind of give you a, a very simple, easy to deploy plan. Um, in general, you know, I, I, my, my takeaway is that, 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 the, that the auto enrolls have the most, uh, you know, have the most potential to make the biggest meaningful dent in this problem. Um, and very much w w whether we pursue that or pursue some other, you know, some, something more of a MEP and flavor, I think the auto enroll of participants and auto uh, deduction are maybe the most powerful tool in the arsenal here. And we heard that over and over uh, that in some ways those are more important than any other feature, human nature being what it is. Um, and I analogize to my own experience where I worked for myself for about um, six or seven years of my working life, and I know better, and in only two of those years did I go to the trouble to find a way to save for my own retirement. So it, it's totally understandable why the numbers of people who, who save when they've got no workplace vehicle to do it is so low. Um, it's also, I want to say, it's totally understandable. We heard from employers about how tremendously difficult and, and burdensome it can be if you're not of a certain scale to set up a set up a 401k plan. We heard from a sophisticated business owner uh, you know, who's reaching retirement age and very successful who never even set up anything for herself. I mean, I, I get I get the difficulties. Um, that, that's, that's why I think the sort of simple intervention here uh, is likely to be the is likely to be the most successful. Yeah, and, and I would agree. This is something that our research has shown. Um, we've done surveys of both workers and small business owners, and uh, you know, small business owners point to the fact that it's very difficult uh, to set up a retirement plan. It's costly. Um, it requires a lot of administrative capability to run a retirement plan. Um, but at the same time, it's uh, I think they're frustrated because they made it very clear in our survey that they want to set up a retirement plan for their workers. They, they want their workers to be financially secure in old age, um, not just because it makes them uh, better workers, because they, they, you know, at the small employer level, they, they really care. Um, and, and, and I will say, by the way, there's a, there's a little bit of a myth here, which which uh, got busted in the course of this process. That, and, and going back to where I started, so much of the talk in the public sector about retirement tends to be about public pensions, that, that when people first hear about this, they're sort of assuming that some of what could be going on is, you know, a, a new defined benefit plan or a sort of government-run plan. Um, as as treasurer, most treasurers have great experience with 529 plans, which are a wonderful innovation, have real potential, um, and, and should be every family's first line of defense and saving for college. Those are none of the above. They're right. they're, they're they're a private sector plan that is facilitated by kind of by by state government action. Um, and to some degree by federal tax law, um, and I think there's a real analogy here to those, right? And that's and that's what we're seeing in some of the other states, uh, sort of this public-private partnership, much like the 529 model. That's right. Um, we do have a, a few questions that have that have come in. Um, Ethan, there's a question here that I'll let you take a first crack at. It's uh, how will a lack of uh, retirement savings impact our day-to-day -day habits and the economy in the future? Well, one thing that comes to mind, and we're already seeing some of this in the data, is, is that folks may actually be working longer. Um, so, so clearly that would have an effect on, on one's day to day um, if a, a lack of, of retirement savings keeps people in the workforce uh, for a more extended period of time. Um, but really, this, this is an issue that we looked at in the study um, on sort of the economic impact size of the equation, um, that households simply won't be able to spend as much if, if they have fewer dollars available to them on an annual basis. Um, and again, I want to emphasize this is happening at a time where healthcare costs are, are, are crowding out other spending already. Um, so folks are going to have to devote, devote potentially a bigger portion of their budget to healthcare um, of a, a shrinking pool of, of money in the first place. So um, that impacts uh, the day-to-day -day for individuals and, and then also 
certainly impacts the state economy than the, than the state's tax base. Uh, let me take a, another question. Maybe maybe we'll make this a jump ball for the for the three of us today. Um, the question is: Is an auto enroll program developed by the state the best option for Pennsylvania to regain physical health over time? If so, how do we demonstrate this uh, to the doubters? Um, I'll, I'll take sort of a first sort of intro, and then maybe let Ethan or the treasurer sort of jump in there. You know, I, I think it's. In terms of an auto enroll program, I think the treasurer said it well. This is about behavioral um, aspects here, and it's really taking advantage of the fact that that you know people want to save, but they don't often take the time um, on their own to set up a retirement plan outside of the workplace. Um, we know that less than 50% of the population saves for retirement outside of the workplace. Um, so an auto enroll program really takes advantage of that inertia and gets people into the program, gets them savings. Obviously. You know, it's a, it's a question of what's the savings level, what's the contribution rate. Um, but, you know, and, and I think, Ethan, you were talking at the end of your presentation about, you know, uh, there are other studies that demonstrate feasibility or the sustainability. Maybe you want to sort of talk about that briefly. Yeah, uh, feasibility studies have, have been undertaken uh, in some of the states uh, that are sort of the first movers on this. But I think uh, in direct answer to this question, I think the data that comes in um, from the initial years of, of some of the states that have set up these programs, have, have set up uh, auto-enroll programs and gotten them rolling, are going to be really fascinating and, and really powerful um, from a research-oriented perspective. Uh, obviously, you don't know sort of the 30-year trend from someone's savings in, in the first year or two, and I don't think you'd want to take the you know, stock market returns as indicative of, of where things are, are headed. But to see those participation rates, um, how many folks are signing up, and then be able to sort of extrapolate that over time, um, and see what kind of a difference that it could make. I, I do think the data that comes in from, from some of the states on the leading edge of this will be really helpful uh, as a national model. Yeah, uh, and this is Joe Forcella. I I don't want to get, um, I want to say two sort of preparatory things. One is um, uh, you know, the, the, the task force uh, is sort of processing a lot of what it heard. I don't want to get too far out ahead of it um, to, to uh, uh, because the reason we convened it was that you know, several heads thinking through this is, is better than one. Um, but uh, I will say, and second, actually, is that let's be clear that anything, if, if in fact we've got more than two million people who are not, you know, who are not saving money, we have 14, or if we add in the full, the full impact, you know, more than 15 billion dollar impact. Let's be clear that anything that gets more people saving and 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 wax of this problem is progress. So let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good ever. Um, but I'm inclined to think that, that, that the auto IRA or some variation of it, and there's the wonderful thing about this, there's a lot of state experiment experimenting going on, and it, see, these things look different in each state, and that's totally appropriate. Um, that's what's great about the state level innovation. There's not a one size fits all. Pennsylvania can have a plan it's uniquely Pennsylvania in the same way that the Oregon plan or the and the California plan are very different. As to the doubters, I do think, going back to what I said, I do think there's a conflation of issues so that people hear, uh, oh, uh, this, this must mean a, a, a public sector run defined benefit plan. Uh, you know, we've seen that movie before and, and it didn't work out. We, uh, part, part of this is there's, there's no good, quick, easy explanation for what an auto IRA plan is. When it's explained, what you tend to have is a you know, very positive reaction, both from employers and employees. So, you know, more explanation is in order. I think the other point I want to make on this is there's there's some uh, you know, there's some potential misgiving that are you crowding out private sector products? And one of the things we heard through the course of these meetings is if if, if if the private sector products were all working right now, we wouldn't you know, we wouldn't be looking at these kind of numbers. Number one and number two, when you create savers, you tend to create savers. So that in the long run, it's quite plausible what you're doing is creating much more demand for other and additional products. When you again nudge people toward savings, there's there's now a whole series of uh, there's research going on about emergency savings accounts. And when people start saving for one thing, they start seeing their financial life differently. My, my guess is what we're going to see out of some of these other states is that 
<clears throat> the auto or iron plans are in fact driving broader demand for uh, financial and investment products, not reducing them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one quick question, someone, uh, maybe I wasn't clear. I said that less than 15, 1.5% of the population saves for retirement outside of the workplace. Uh, just to, be, to clear up something I said a little bit earlier. Um, uh, another question reads, it sounds like it is probably too late for baby boomers who have not already saved uh, to start saving now. Can you talk about how, as policymakers, you need to address the needs of younger workers who could uh, conceivably have pension income that they start saving now, as well as the needs of people who are closer to retirement? And let me let me just sort of start that one off a little bit. Uh, that you know, just personally, and I think professionally, I would say it's, it's uh, not too late for anybody to start saving for retirement, uh, younger or older. And and I'll let sort of Ethan and the treasurer sort of chime in there. But um, I will sort of do sort of a, a shameless plug for a piece we have coming out in a week or two from Pew, um, looking at what can be done with. Um, account balances that are saved through a hypothetical um, auto IRA program. And specifically, we're looking at how many workers can um, delay claiming of their Social Security benefits, which um, for every year you delay, you increase benefits by 7 to 8%. Um, so that'll be coming out. But in addition, and I don't want to sort of steal our own thunder, but uh, so look for that. But in addition, you know, even if you're not, don't have a, a huge account balance saved, uh, whether you started too late or, or you know, later in life, um, there's certainly other uses such as emergency savings. Um, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid don't pay for everything that might come up. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's too late. Yeah, at, at 54, I, I'm constitutionally unable to admit that it's too late. Um, <laughs> it, it is one of the one of the one, one of the quirks of the study is the data set that's available to us most easily is sort of looking, you know, the farther out we attempt to project implications to the shakier the ground is. So looking at the next 15 years and the cohort um, that's that's uh, reaching retirement age, that is the proxy we have for understanding, you know, sort of what on an ongoing basis the implication may be. It's true that what, you know, anything we put in place is likely to have its biggest in, impact for, for, the young, for the youngest people um, who are, Adapt it, you know, who are feeling the adaptation to the to the new economy, um, and that's just due to the power and magic of compounding. But it would not be without impact for someone even who's closer. Um, so I, I think, you know, what I said previously is true here, which is something is better than nothing, uh, even if we don't fully solve, even if we don't fully solve the gap uh, for someone who's my age, um, but do fully solve it for someone who's the age of my children. Did you want to jump in on that? Or? No, uh, actually the uh, the notion of delaying Social Security that you touched on was, was the first thing that came to my mind and how um, even a relatively small uh, amount of money can make a, a very big difference if you're able to um, to delay and, and then receive a, a larger amount for the remainder of retirement. And, and I think another uh, related issue is just favorable tax treatment of retirement savings um, compared to earned income. So. Um, even for folks that, um, that may not be able to benefit from the power of compounding in the same way, there are still some mechanisms in there that, that make it useful even over a relatively short amount of time. Um, we'll try and get in a, a couple more questions here. I know we're approaching the end of the hour, but uh, we've, we've got a number of great questions. So um, the next one is, given these large projected savings, is the Treasurer considering innovative financing mechanisms, for example, social in impact bonds, if the savings are direct and quantifiable, private investors may be interested in funding government retirement initiatives in exchange for a portion of the public savings. Well, so uh, this is, I've used the word crisis because I think we have one uh, a couple of times. And the definition of crisis is everything should be on the table and all ideas are welcome, um, including this one. And thanks for bringing it to our attention. Um, the, you know, my, my understanding of sort of classic social impact bonds is they're uh, sort of solving for a, a different kind of problem, uh, but that's something that uh, an idea worth considering if there's a if there's a uh, way to conceptualize this where they might have the role. 
have, might have a role. Important to note, and this is going back to some degree to the earlier question about uh, you know, potential misgivings about the, the possible solutions. In, in a, a mature, uh, you know, in any of these programs, once mature, uh, there's relatively trivial ongoing expense to the state that sponsors them. Um, now, there's, it is true there's startup costs to these, and maybe that's where this idea comes into play, actually, mm -hmm. because those startup costs have been contentious in some states. Uh, but those startup costs are in the order of a few million dollars. Um, once a program like this gets to scale, um, you know, the expenses uh, become on a per person basis trivial and are borne by the program. And the, the Commonwealth, in most states, 529 programs, they are largely financed. Uh, yeah, self-financed with fees on the uh, That's right. on the investments. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, maybe just uh, one more question. We'll see. And, and by the way, if we don't get to your question today, we'll, we we have your name. We'll follow up. Um, we can follow up directly uh, with you. Uh, so maybe one quick question on auto uh, on auto IRA versus state map or multiple employer plan. Is there a scenario of both? Is that a good model for the states? And I think this is just maybe a good question for, for clarity for folks that are a little bit new to the different options that the treasurer walked through. You mentioned the marketplace, the state auto IRA, sometimes called secure choice in certain states like California, and the multiple employer plans, which is basically a group plan. I, I think it's important to note that these aren't mutually exclusive programs. In theory, you could have all three in, going on in a state where people are automatically enrolled in an auto IRA program, but there's an option for a MEP, and there's there's also maybe a marketplace where small employers could shop uh, for a plan. Um, currently, there's no state that I'm aware of that is pursuing sort of a combination, but that certainly doesn't, and, and maybe because it's uh, in terms of uh, uh, baby steps. Um, there is actually Washington State that has a marketplace, and the city of Seattle um, has an auto IRA uh, program. Uh, but not sort of a whole statewide uh, coordinated uh, program. So it's an interesting idea, but it's, it's um, I think, still uh, on the table. Um, I don't know if either I, of you have thoughts about well, that. Well, I, I think the questioner is on to something. I think that th these, aren't, these aren't either or, and they, and they both and could work. Um, these have different, they have different appeals, um, and, and the appeal of the auto IRA is that it is a sort of a very bare bones, um, structured as a Roth IRA with the advantages and, and, and drawbacks that that has, has limitations on how much can be saved. The advantage of a MEP is you can get into larger contribution limits. You can uh, get into potential employer contributions if they want. Um, so uh, so I, I actually think a sort of kind of stacked approach um, you know, is, is very much worth considering. I think it's a very insightful question. Um, I think we're just about out of time. I don't know if uh, Ethan or the treasurer, if you want to make any uh, final thoughts uh, in conclusion. Um, just thank everyone again for your interest, and thank you, Pew, for your uh, leadership in the space. Great. Well, thanks to you both for um, joining us today. Uh, for more information, uh, if you have questions, uh, if you want to follow up, you see Benny Martinez's uh, uh, contact information. He's our communications officer here at Pew. He'd be happy to sort of forward your questions or thoughts um, to the panelists today. Um, again, feel free to visit, visit the project webpage at pewtrust.org slash retirement savings. Um, thank you for joining us today. And, and